Okay, so this is last talk of this meeting. It's becoming, I mean, becoming a little bit emotional. <laughs> it's a pleasure to welcome Ewan Berne from the European Bioinformatics Institute in Inkstan and the Wellcome Trust. I mean, he's best known as head of the Ensemble project. I mean, that would be enough to summarize, I mean, already in important activities. That would be enough. But it's important to say that he's originally trained as a biochemist, moved quickly into bioinformatics, and published his first set of programs, pairwise and searchwise, while he was an undergraduate in Oxford. He first joined EBI in 2000 as team leader and later as senior scientist. And one of his other activity, I mean, uh, for the general, I mean, the well-being of our own community is that he's a significant promoter of open source in bioinformatics and science, and that's important to mention. As geographical links, I put Oxford, we study Cold Spring Arbor for a short while, and Inkston, Sanger Center, and EBI. Bio links, of course, Richard Durbin, Sean Eddy, Alex Batman, you recognize all of the same, yeah, I mean, yeah, Sanger Mafia. <laughs> and Toby Gibson and the whole ensemble team. Now, just one thing, I can say, I mean, you're already on the podium, but I could say, entrez, enfin nous sommes ensemble, and just a small explanation. Okay, entrez is NCBI, Life Search Science Search Engine. Now, maybe not all of you know who gave it that name. It's Jean-Michel Clavery, which thought it was a nice name, and then basically it became, uh, I mean, David Lipman thought, oh yeah, why not? So it became entrez. Then we had Ensemble, I mean, and which means all together. Uh, Ewen is also now the coordinator of an EU grant called Enfin. I don't know if you're going to describe this, but anyway, that's, I mean, a third grant. So I guess your next step is you have to work on SOM, which stands for System of the Organization of Many, Many Existing Sequence. Thank you, Ewen, for being here. Thank you. So thank you very much, Amos, for inviting me and also um, giving me the chance to be the last person to talk to you. I don't know if this uh, is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, I'm sorry that I stand in the way of your uh, midday capricinos or, or whatever you plan to do in the afternoon. Uh, so I hope I'll be um, relatively short. But I, I'd like to start a little bit by, um, by reminiscing. Reminiscing, um, I'm not actually that old, I guess, so I'm not sure that I have many things to reminisce, but I do remember the first time I met Amos. And the reason why is because I knew he was at the meeting that I was going to. It was some proteins meeting in the UK, and I knew that Amos was going to be there. And so I was scanning around the room uh, to try and spot this guy. And in the back, there was someone furiously typing. Uh, on a laptop, and absolutely furiously typing on a laptop, looking up, looking down, typing, 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 looking up, asking the odd question, looking down again. And I was intrigued about what this guy was doing, and so I went round to see what on earth was on a sort of, you know, out of the corner of my eye, what, what was on his laptop, what was so engrossing. And there was this kind of slightly, uh, you know, late 80s style interface. <laughs> with many curious cursor uh, kind of shortcuts and things like that. And it slowly dawned on me that I was not only seeing Amos, but seeing Swissprot in the midst of creation. I was seeing it actually moving from his brain uh, into the computer uh, this way. So it was, a, it was a great sort of pleasure to witness that. So what I'm, I'm going to talk about, and, and I'm going to be, be a bit contrarian, I'm going to argue that there's more to life than proteins. I'm sorry, Amos and Rolf. There's just a little bit more outside uh, of proteins to, to look at. Not that much, I have to admit. You know, not a great deal, uh, but, but there's a little bit more. And I'm going to very briefly touch on three projects that I'm involved in, Ensemble, Encode, and React Home. So, Ensemble. Um, I just want to quickly give you, uh, Ensemble is one of these huge, uh, rather like SwissProt, it's getting this, or Uniprot, this kind of super tanker behavior, which means uh, you kind of crash through the ocean 
uh, it, it's very hard to turn, but it, it, it's very, very solid and keeps moving forwards inexorably. I just want to give you some updates about where Ensemble is. Ensemble is a, is a system focused on annotation of vertebrate genomes. And for human and for mouse, um, uh, or for all of our genomes, one of the main things we do is find out where protein coding genes are. Now, for human and mouse, um, a lot of that is about taking cDNAs from the genome, reconciling them back to the genome, and also taking cDNAs from closely related genomes and projecting them on. But increasingly, we are also folding in manual information from our colleagues at the Havana Group in Sanger. And it slightly frustrates me, being the person who wrote the automated uh, bits of code, but anybody who does biology knows that if you put a human, a trained human curator into the loop, you reach higher quality. Now, again, that slightly sticks in my throat as someone who writes generally programs to try and not to have to do this, um, but it's inevitable, actually, that that final piece of quality is done by, by human beings. And that means that we are progressively shrinking the amount of information that is coming from very automated methods and relying on a much higher set of stable information in this manual annotation. And this slide here is one of our internal QC slides. I don't really want to talk you through it, but just to mention that we use uh, two data sets as our, our main arbiters of, of whether we're, we're improving in quality or not. And one is the, the Swissprot part of Uniprot, and the other one is the curated part of RefSeq. And the, basically the blue and the red are perfect or near perfect um, genome matches to the protein. In other words, the structure that we make on the genome is perfectly consistent with, uh, uh, with the Swiss prot uh, uh, record. And then this kind of beige color at the top, or this is stuff that we're working on. And you can see these, these different uh, uh, lines are different human releases and different mouse releases, basically about once every half a year here. Uh, and you can see that it's progressively getting better we want to push this to the point where there's no, basically none of this light beige color. Now we do a lot more than just looking after um, human and mouse, and there are many genomes which will not be finished uh, and will not have the kind of investment um, into resources around them, and yet have many, many interesting things, uh, pieces of biology to determine. Uh, and a good example is chicken, and in chicken, one is what one's doing when one's finding genes is using some cDNAs from chicken, but predominantly the large resource of proteins, which are in mammals, and projecting them onto the genome. So just to give you a little thought about the, the chicken here, in fact, I'm just to remind you, we're all surrounded by living dinosaurs, and those are birds. So the chicken is a representative of the, the dinosaur lineage. And perhaps the most, there's lots of interesting things about chickens, I can tell you, <laughs> surprisingly enough. Um, but uh, from this perspective, we uh, experimentally tested our automated build. In this case, we get a 90% perfect prediction that the, the gene structure that we make on the, the genome is perfectly um, found when we do RT-PCR, and 4% is within 10 base pairs uh, error. Um, chicken was about two years ago. One of the exciting genomes coming up this year is the stickleback. Um, again, I can tell you some interesting things about sticklebacks if you want to know why people get obsessed about this. But again, we have uh, a very good set of numbers here showing that even in genomes that do not have a great deal of cDNA evidence, we can find many protein coding genes, or most indeed protein coding genes, at very high accuracy. And one of the challenges that Ensemble is facing is the incredible number of species that are being sequenced, even just in the vertebrates. Um, and this is not helped by the fact that a number of species are being sequenced in low coverage format. This is far cheaper to do, so 2x genomes. It's far cheaper to do, but far more complicated to handle um, uh, inside uh, computationally. And so these are these slightly weird organisms, armadillo, anaphant, tanarac. Tanarac is the Madagascan hedgehog, uh, would you believe? Uh, so there's a, series, a whole menagerie of beasts entering Ensemble, uh, and we are going to look after them all. 
And as one gets more and more species, it becomes more and more important to organize the relationships between the genes and these species. And it's not the case that everything has a one-to-one -one relationship. This is a gene tree of the uh, insulin peptide. And as you can see, there are two copies of this gene in the rodents, in mouse and rat. And there are also two copies of this in the fish, in uh, fugu, tetrodon, uh, and zebrafish. But importantly, those two copies are not orthologous to each other. They're not um, due to the same common duplication. Instead, two separate duplications arose, once in the rodent lineage and once in the fish lineage. And therefore, from this tree, we have a series of what we would call one-to-one -one orthologs, but then also a series of one-to-many orthologs. This, the human gene has two orthologs in, uh, in mouse. And then it gets even more complicated when we think about the relationship between the mouse genes and the, uh, the fish genes. And here the important thing to realize is each gene in mouse is orthologous to both of the genes in fish and vice versa. And that's because the, the duplication has happened independently in both of the lineages. Uh, and there's more complicated things. This is just a data slide, again, from our own QC, which tells us that this new method, this tree-based method, which will be, has gone live, in fact, already on the latest release of Ensemble, but the next release, which is due out uh, next week, will have graphical views of the trees, rather like this picture here. And we do lots of other pieces of comparative genomics. This is genome-wide multiple alignments, um, uh, uh, five-way multiple alignment, which is available. And finally, uh, the thing to mention about Ensemble, I hope it's a final thing, yeah, um, uh, is that we're investing a lot more in variation resources. This is showing the resequencing on different mouse strains. And what you're seeing at the bottom and in this diagram is the relationship between which strains in mouse have which SNPs. And so uh, the, there's, uh, the different strains in mouse will share different uh, variants uh, within each other and to the reference. Now, the final thing I'd like to uh, say about Ensemble um, is that we have a really uh, aggressive outreach program. And I'd really like to encourage you to take advantage of that. So there are a number of ways of you to getting involved with us in different, in different manners. So of course, I hope you've all visited us on the web, which is www.ensemble.org. But then there is a series of progressively more geeky ways of uh, getting uh, uh, in bed with us, basically. And just to mention that uh, we hold nothing back. So all of our data is free for you to use. But then there are two other things which I think are really worth taking advantage of us. So there's a program which we call Geek for a Week. Uh, and this is when you send someone to us. So it's your geek, and if you're your own geek, you can send yourself. Uh, and basically, you turn up with a project, discuss a project with us that you'd like to do, turn up with a laptop, uh, and we will host you and, and help you um, uh, work through that project with Ensemble with you having to just ask someone next door rather than do a big email uh, uh, thing. We also have a very active outreach team, uh, one Italian, one uh, Dutchman, and uh, one Spaniard. Of course, they all speak English, but you can see the spread of languages as well around that. And they will fly anywhere on the planet and have done uh, and give an ensemble course. The person who runs that is called Jose. So we call that the Jose for a day. Uh, 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 thing, uh, uh, a program, and uh, basically only the travel costs need to be covered for Jose. If you are a long way away, we can help you get a couple of neighboring institutes together so Jose can spend a whole week traveling around Australia or whatever, and they regularly do rather bizarre tours of the world. Um, and this is a great way for people in your institute to learn how to get more out of Ensemble. So for both of these programs, email helpdesk at ensemble.org for more information. So now I'm going to very quickly introduce you to a project called the, the ENCODE project. This is where 1% of the human genome has been selected, and about 40 different groups are throwing many different experimental methods at that 1% of the human genome 
to understand in great detail what is going on in the human genome um, uh, that gives all this fascinating control and diversity. And one, I'm just going to summarize a couple of results uh, for this. So one aspect uh, of this is that protein coding loci are far more complex than we, I think, had ever thought. So on average, there's, there's five transcripts per locus that we can identify in these regions. And that is, in fact, above previous estimates when, when you took genome-wide estimates of the number of transcripts per lo loci. But interestingly enough, many, many of these transcripts do not encode proteins. They are, they use sometimes protein coding exons, but they, they don't seem to have any obvious open reading claim. And even the ones which do encode proteins, when you look more closely at these proteins, these proteins look weird. So, of course, we don't know whether proteins are made, but we can look at these large open reading frames and ask whether these large open reading frames make sense. And in collaboration with uh, the European project Biosapiens that Janet runs, um, uh, we've looked structurally, or rather we, Alfonso Valencia, Michael Tress, Janet, and people have looked structurally at where the differences between the isoforms lie. And the interest, interesting thing is that many of these differences are very severe structural problems. And I immediately uh, thought that the interpretation was that these transcripts, although that they exist, they exist as RNA, that they weren't being made as proteins. But Alfonso has persuaded me that it's not even so obvious that that is the case, that maybe these proteins are made, and rather like these weird GFP experiments where you can express two parts of GFP, and they somehow fold when they're brought close together. In a similar way, these partial proteins that have unstructured regions may be able to do something clever in the cellular context. I think it's a very interesting and, and poorly understood area of human biology is what these slightly wacky proteins are doing. But um, to be honest, uh, a, a lot of focus in the ENCODE project is about understanding not the intron exon structure of genes, but what is regulating when genes are being expressed and their splicing patterns. And we know that there are many of the players in this, for example, polymerase II is a large complex which binds at the start of the genes and then, of course, makes the RNA transcript. But there's lots of other proteins, like MYC would be a transcription factor, E2F2 would be another one. And then there are different types of histone modifications. So the, the classic one is the tail on uh, histone 3. So histone 3 lysine 4 trimethylation is a particular histone mark. And for each of these factors, one can imagine pulling down, uh, one does these chip-chip experiments in which um, in vivo one measures the occupancy of these, um, uh, these proteins on the DNA. Now these uh, experiments are incredibly data-rich and very hard to handle. What I'm showing you here is work from Zuping Wang's lab in Boston University where they've uh, aggregated the signal for, for some different factors over multiple transcription start sites. And you can see this classic, what is called histone code, which is particular histone modifications are there on active promoters and, in fact, are absent on inactive promoters. And you can also do this for different here on transcription factors. And the interesting point here is that some of these transcription factors were thought to be rather uh, uh, specific to specific regulatory genes but in fact look like they're far more general in the fact that, that there are many, they're across many different gene signals. Now, um, I can't tell you what a headache it is to handle this data, and we are well aware that this data is very quickly going to scale from being 1% of the human genome to 100%, and we are building in systems now to handle that data in Ensemble, but more importantly, to work with the laboratories that are generating this data directly so that those uh, laboratories can set up, um, use software that we provide to help manage, analyze, and then export this data into um, appropriate sort of ensemble-like uh, uh, processes. So my final um, uh, talk is, uh, final piece, is, is on Reactome. 
And React Home is very, very different from the other projects that I'm involved in. Uh, Ensemble is big, huge. We talk about millions of SNPs, massive compute, many, many rows in the database. The React Home database is lovingly curated and can probably fit on a flash uh, disk. I could carry it around in my pocket uh, uh, on my little uh, uh, jump drive. And what it, React Home is trying to tackle is a representation of pathways which is more computable than this. This is perhaps one of the ways you think about pathways. Insulin binds the insulin receptor, causing it to dimerize. The dimerized form autophosphorylates itself on six cytoplasmic tyrosines, et cetera, et cetera. We change that, um, these sorts of descriptions into um, uh, what we think of as a qualitative representation of the pathways. And so we think of pathways as being only built up of reactions, where reactions have physical entities that on the inputs and physical entities on the outputs, potentially physical entities as catalysts, and one has a conversion of those three different sets of physical entities. And outputs of physical entities can be inputs to new reactions or can be catalysts to new reactions. Now, this network that we create, it's important to realize that we don't try and duplicate anything that's going on. So, for example, for the definition of the different catalytic act activities, we use Go from uh, Michael, Susie, and Judy et al. For the definition of the proteins, we use Unipot. What we're trying to do is take these effectively dictionaries and put them together in this network structure that tries to represent the biochemical reactions that happen. And these structures here become quite complicated. This is a schematic, in fact, of the insulin receptor pathway, where each of the, the green blobs represents a different reaction, and each of the small brackets represents a physical entity which is either going in or coming out of that reaction. And you see it becomes very quickly not really a, a linear pathway, but a web, a network of reactions. Uh, that is formed. Um, and uh, we, just to say, we have a lot of them, and the way we think about visualizing these reactions now is this map, which we call the starry sky. The idea is, is that um, this, is, this is arbitrary. Each arrow here represents a reaction. Uh, this is arbitrary, but you get used to it, and you, you pick up where things are in the sky. So, if, um, for example, there's a circle um, again, I'll see if I can do this with the cursor. Ooh. This circle here is the, the Krebs cycle. Up here is glycolysis. Uh, this is the cell cycle. This is the not signaling pathway. This is the insulin receptor signaling pathway. And right over here, there's, in fact, um, the clotting cascade. So you can see we have a large variety of different pathways, all represented as these biochemical reactions. And once we have these as computable units, we can now ask some interesting questions. And ha what I've colored this map in here is how many times do we see this reaction disappear in a lineage-specific way? So not the fact that, that, uh, that certain reactions have only occurred very recently in evolution. What I'm looking for is evolutionary turnover, where different lineages have deleted a reaction. There's a lot of variation, uh, and, and the details are very interesting. So here in tryptophan catabolism, in fact, the tail end of the pathway seems to be often deleted in a lineage-specific manner. In DNA repair, the top pathway of DNA repair is tremendously well-conserved across multiple species, but the other pathways that recognize different sorts of DNA legions are, in fact, very labile over evolutionary time. And then in the insulin receptor signaling pathway, one gets an interesting case where one clearly sees modules. Um, there's sets of uh, what, what one might think of as a linear pathway. It's, in fact, three sort of modules that are stuck together in human for in insulin signaling. They're stuck together in a different way for different processes, both in human, and some of those modules, kind of as a whole, uh, are deleted in a lineage-specific manner. So I, um, I'm going to be rounding it up now, and I want to bring us back to proteins. I said that there was life beyond proteins. 
but perhaps not a great deal. And I'll explain why that is. I often think of the genome as the natural index for biology. Most of the time we do an experiment, that experiment is defined by unique pieces of DNA. The way to understand the relationship between those unique pieces of DNA is to use a genome like an index. You take your DNA, you place it on the genome, you therefore have that unique place. It doesn't matter if the gene structures have changed or whatever, you've mapped the experiment to an index which never changes. And from this index, one can imagine looking at the genes, regulation, variation. But although this is an, an index, you want that index to take you somewhere useful. You want to learn things about uh, that, basically, that biological, the biological objects at that point in the genome. You want to understand the pathways, structures, and literature that are associated with that index position. And what is the piece that glues that together? Well, it's proteins. So if the genome is the index, I believe proteins are the hub. And... Uh, or the pages of the book that one goes to look up. And we've really been gifted by Amos and Rolf a, a wonderful hub, a wonderful organizing principle, which is Uniprot, or Swissprot, or whatever we like to call the, the prots. Um, uh, and it is, I have found it so much easier when, uh, when I've just said, when we have a discussion about how we're going to track this, I say, we're going to use Uniprot uh, accession numbers uh, and then we let Uniprot worry about uh, tracking these things to death. Uh, uh, and we concentrate on uh, the other stuff away from that hub. So thank you very much, Amos and Rolf, for making such a great hub. So I've got two thank you pages. Um, as you can imagine, I don't do a great, I don't do all the work here. Uh, there's a, I have a great team um, uh, uh, at the EBI and the Sanger, uh, the Ensemble Project is a joint project between EBI and Sanger, my counterpart is Tim Hubbard, who you may have recognized in one of Wynn's comedy slides. It was the tie, he was wearing the tie that um, Wynn was eating. Um, and there, here's a whole series of people uh, in the different parts of Ensemble, um, uh, which is a great team. And I also mentioned um, uh, my, the other project which runs in my group, React Home. Uh, it's a smaller team and it's a joint project between myself and Lincoln Stein's group in Cold Spring Harbor, um, it seems to be a common theme to always do this as collaborations. And then there were two consortia that I mentioned. So one was the ENCODE consortia, which is funded by NHGRI in the United States. There are 40 groups worldwide, and I can't list them, but I'd like to draw attention to Zipping Wang's group in Boston University, who uh, supplied the slides for the chip chip data uh, there. Um, and then via Sapiens, which is 20 groups across Europe, uh, and the slides about the structural work of proteins uh, were done by Alfonso Valencia and Michael Tress, and that's a tight collaboration with the EBI folk uh, with Janet. So thank you very much. Sorry that I'm between you and lunch and beach, uh, and uh, uh, it's been a great pleasure uh, to be here and talk. So, oh, do we have any questions for Ewan? <laughs> We're not quite finished, however. Oh, thank you, Ewan, again. <laughs>